<laughs> yeah. But anyway, you know, at, at, at those times, it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, we were been talking for years of what we were going to do. And my vision on that in Winston's, let's, you know, and, and obviously under the influence of Harvey, let's, let's, let's take our instrument to another level. You know, and that's what we all tried to do. And we wanted to communicate with people all over the world. And at that time, the only thing you had was a telephone and, and letters. And we spent well, a lot of money calling and talking. And it's yeah, hard to believe there, it. there was no communication between and amongst tubists. Yeah. Because if you played an orchestra somewhere, you were the only tuba player in town. And the next closest tuba player was 150, 200, 300 miles away. And the next one was another 300 miles away. And there was, there was no motivation. No one was collectively working to generate repertoire to work on the improvement of the instruments, to try and improve the possibility of employment. And these were all the motivations for forming TUBA, mm -hmm. the things that I just mentioned, to come up with better repertoire. I remember the first the, the book that I mentioned earlier that Bill Bell and I did in 1965. I remember the discography for that book that listed all the tuba recordings available in 1965. I think there were seven. Seven recordings, LPs for those of you that don't remember, that featured the tuba, seven. And of course right now there are two, three, four hundred tuba CDs. Everybody's well, well, at least, everybody's yeah. doing And that. there were only seven. Bill Bells had come out in 1957, Harvey's was shortly after that, Peter Popeil had one out, Rex Connor had one out, oh, yeah. and there were two or three other scraggly ones. There were seven recordings that you could listen to in those days. The tuba ensemble section, which I knew quite intimately about, had maybe about five or six pages, and that's not like single lines. Each one would maybe be about three or four on a page of tuba duets, trios, maybe a couple of quartets. And I even made up some stuff just to throw in there, just to have something in the book. But that's how pathetic the repertoire for the instruments were in 1965. It was pathetic. television. It was, yeah, absolutely. It was pathetic. So that was a strong motivation for starting the TUBA, the, to get the manufacturers on board, to improve the quality of the instruments and the consistency, consistency yeah. of the instruments. Dan can tell you, if you had 30 Alexanders sitting there, which is a real popular instrument, there'd be one or two great ones, three or four usable ones, and then 10 or 20 pieces of junk. At, 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 at that particular time, all the tubes was made, and they were quite good, but the fifth partial was so doggone flat. flat. You have to you use Chinese use fingering. You yeah. know, try to play Carnival Venice on that stuff. It was yeah. impossible. Well, Dan and I were in the Army together, and he was playing uh, Alexander at the time, and he got involved in the European tuba thing and helped me get my first tuba, mm -hmm. and you, you made those connections to, well, to you know, Europe uh, uh, actually, that really helped uh, modernize things. Well, what happened you was that, and, yeah, and yeah, well, Jake, uh, Fred Merrick was starting the business of Custom Music Company at that time, and he wanted to, you know, who can I get to help do this? And Jake suggested, uh, why don't you team up with Parantoni and Tucci? He talked to me about it, and, and uh, you know. I was an educator at the time. And what ran. was Bob doing at that time? Bob, Bob was actually he was over in this country, but he was he was in uh, he played in Vienna. Yeah, he played in Vienna, and he started to have connections over there. And we knew a couple. Fred had already. It was amazing. Fred had to he'd, he'd come over there, and all of a sudden discover Rudy Mano. And that was our first one. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then he discovered Peter Hirschman. I don't know yeah. how he did it because he knew nothing about instruments except he had a love to just to develop it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he also had money. You know, which, which, you know, the bottom line is, is you, you, you get them to do that. So um, Bob and I got involved with Rudy Mano, and I think the time what we met in 69 at uh, Midwest, mm -hmm. I was already involved as a clinician, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember meeting Bill Bell, actually, for the first time. I yeah. never knew him, yeah. and uh, uh, that's how we got together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I had Rudy Mano over there, and we got Rudy Mano with Jake, and, you know, start helping him with those tubas at that particular time. Now, our goal was, you know, if we can get one making a little bit more instrument, and in the United States, no one would talk to us because they didn't want to do anything with the tuba. You can make three trumpets, make a hell of a lot more money, mm -hmm. and, you know, there's a lot of physical work, and they didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So we went to Europe. Yeah. You know? And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. We figured, hey, well, Rudy, if we get some good lings out there, then Mirafone is going to come in and get a little bit more work. And he did, you know. Yeah. And we'd play this one against this one in, in, in the best possible sense just to try to get it going. I remember back then there was only one mouthpiece. And I took a look at a trumpet player, and the guy had all these stuff, and I said, I want that, you know. <laughs> Why can't yeah, we do that? 
Yeah, well, Hell which is good. Great. We had or, a hell of a or a Bach twenty four or eighteen. <coughs> or a hell of a, that was it. Those I mean, were fine too. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but all of us had little goals in a sense. We were already involved in it, and of course, this all came and we we, we got together with Harvey at these kind of things, and you know, we talk about it. Why don't you See, do that, this? But that yeah. was what that was the purpose behind That's TUBA. Purpose. Yeah. That was what TUBA was all about to get all these people with these different goals working for a common cause and working to 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 accomplish something for the instrument and have. Uh, one one organization there that they could and it's worked guys yeah. oh, it's boy. really worked look at the repertoire oh, so what we've done with yeah. the repertoire and since in in 40 45 years look what's happened to the quality of the instruments the number of the instruments and other look than the current that. economic situation the job situation you know as far as the military stuff and orchestral stuff and academic what positions for euphonium and sand tubas these oh, things yeah. didn't exist 40 years ago the level of playing. Level of playing. I mean, well, it's and you know, you know, course. I have it's to go. Phenomenal. Yeah. yeah, phenomenal. I mean, yeah. it's. It, I don't think there's any instrument that's. Uh, that's certainly not any of the brass instruments, but almost any other instrument that's had this kind of growth in the last time. Well, Harvey always referred to it as a tuba renaissance, which is a little misleading because renaissance means rebirth. That assumed that you'd ever been born in the first place. <laughs> and so the tuba, as we know, was invented in 1835. And then, but it wasn't until 1955 that Paul Hindemith and Vaughn Williams wrote major works for the instrument. So, I mean, by the time I was a high school kid in the, in the late 50s, that there was only one recording, Bill Bell, and there were only two major pieces of music that had ever been composed with the instrument at that point in time. And you look at what, what people have now available to them, a lot of that, and the bulk of that, and people don't give TUBA or ITEA credit for it. Oh. And ITEA is responsible, the organization, the existence of that organization. Now, people did find it originally, and tuba players were very independent. They always, tuba players were very, very independent. Roger's thing was, what, are we the way we are because we are tuba players, or are we tuba players because that's the way we are? Mm -hmm. But when you only got, you know, you're the only tuba player in the orchestra, and then the next tuba player is 300 miles away, you become very independent in survival. You got survival skills. And that's why, you know, and you know, you're highly motivated. Look how many tuba players end up being the personnel managers of the orchestras and stuff because they were motivated well, to know, do yeah. that. There's a, there's and a deans. Lot, yeah. yeah. And yeah. deans yeah. of yeah. universities. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, the interesting thing was, is back in those times, we weren't taken too seriously as university professors, you know what I mean? Uh, and you had to work on that because it was a fact or a thought that anybody in a professional world, you could either teach or you could play. Right. So, yeah, you know, so they thought, well, you're, you, know, you, you weren't taking too seriously because, you know, if you're in a university, you can't play. And I'm talking about the no, guys. Not, from not just the university, Dan. As a, as, tubist, as a tubist, even among other musicians, mm -hmm. the tuba was looked down on as some kind of lowly no, 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 third no. cousin and, of and, some you, kind. You know, and the trumpets. And it went in all that instrument. So the, the, the academic thing, well, you know, you can, you can teach, but you can't play. Well, well Harvey's yeah. position on that was... It's based on the repertoire yeah. of the instrument, and then, you know, and if the be best thing you got going for you is bells above or sleeping if he takes a walk yeah. or whatever, um, if that's, that's the top repertoire that you've got, and then the other musicians they've got Mozart concertos and Strauss concertos and whatever else, and they look at the tuba and then they look at the repertoire. I said, well, it can't be a serious instrument because no one's ever written for it. So that well, that was the motivation to get the repertoire where it is today. Dan I, Dan and I both went to the Catholic University for our master's degrees in Washington because we were connected through the Army Band. And there. they paid for it. And they paid for it. And uh, but I finished and I said I wanted to get a DMA. You, they would not let me do it. And the reason was because they didn't think there was a, a literature. I had I wrote a big paper trying to justify it. They still said no. A few years later, of course, they. They, uh, they what year, what year was that? 67 is the year I've got yeah. my master's, yeah. but uh, that too. would have been 68, 69. Yeah, and at that point, the repertoire was still in its infancy. So it's Just a few years later, yeah. and so that's, that's, you know, that drove me to other places.